my name is Russ Derry. I'm the Director of Education at Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan, and we are very pleased to have with us this evening Oren Sager, who is the, uh, a neurosurgeon with the University of Michigan Health System uh, with the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program. And uh, Dr. Sager, can you just introduce yourself and, and give a brief summary of your clinical and research interests and then also your experience with this topic? So, yes, uh, my name is Oren Sager. I'm a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Michigan, as you mentioned. I've been um, in uh, the University of Michigan uh, since 1993, and I'm what uh, they might call a functional neurosurgeon. So I do um, a number of types of operations uh, that have to do with the function of the nervous system, and that epilepsy uh, surgery is one of those, um, and now it's probably the main type of functional neurosurgery that I do. So there's, as we'll talk about, there's a lot of different types of surgery for epilepsy. That's, uh, that's one of, uh, a, a big component of functional neurosurgery. I've been uh, at the University of Michigan for, for a long time, and I'm part of the comprehensive epilepsy team. I have a clinical um, interest, obviously, in functional neurosurgery, uh, but I also have research interests uh, that have to do with it. I I have a, a basic science laboratory that looks at, uh, at blood, blood, flow in the, blood flow in the brain, and, um, and uh, I also have a collaboration with some of the epilepsy neurology uh, research faculty looking at uh, um, a, a tissue, a, a in vitro tissue that, uh, that has um, epileptic potential. So basically looking at the, um, uh, the basic science component of why uh, certain um, uh, parts of the brain can seize. So that's kind of a, a summary of uh, what I do both the, in the clinical realm and also in the research. Great. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Sager, can you give a, a quick overview? Uh, I know that's hard to do, a quick overview, but just an overview of some of the most common types of brain surgery for epilepsy and, and under what circumstances they're used. Um, we'll really be focusing uh, on the most common type of epilepsy surgery for most of the call, which would be uh, lobectomy. But um, if you can talk about some of the other types, because um, I know there is some interest uh, in people on the call in some of the other types of surgery as well. Right. So, so if you want to look at the whole um, group of epilepsy surgery, they really fall into um, w one of uh, three types of, of procedures. Uh, the first procedure, probably the most common procedure that we do uh, for epilepsy, now, now these are talk, talking about therapeutic uh, procedures, not not diagnostic procedures. Uh, the first most common one is, is surgery where we remove a portion of the brain that's causing the seizures. Uh, the most common type there is uh, temporal lobectomy because uh, it turns out that the most um, commonly affected part of the brain that causes uh, epilepsy is in the temporal lobe. So the temporal lobectomy is by far the most common type of procedure, but really any part of the brain um, is capable of causing seizures, and if if it's really only a single portion of the brain that's causing it, that's uh, one of the uh, options people have uh, in terms of trying to uh, be rid of their seizures, and that is removal of that part of the brain. So, so temporal lobectomy and then other resective or resection-type surgery. So... So it could be a lobectomy, uh, like a frontal lobectomy, or it could be just a lesion resection, uh, and, and those kind of procedures. So those are the resective procedures. They're, they're considered, by and large, curative. Uh, at least that, that's the goal. Then, then there are procedures known as disconnection procedures, and that's uh, something that we use uh, at times uh, alone, and at times we use them um, in coordination with resection. So... What, what, we, what I mean by that is that, that you know, different parts of the brain talk to each other, and sometimes either we uh, cannot safely remove the part of the brain that's causing the seizure, uh, but we can disconnect it from areas around it that might spread the seizure. Uh, and, and that can be a, a disconnection that happens very locally, and we have a procedure known as uh, multiple subpeal transections, and those are basically when we... Uh, 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 prevent the seizure from spreading from one area to another area right next to it. But there are other uh, procedures known as um, major disconnections, and these include things like uh, corpus callosotomy, 
this is an old time procedure where we disconnect one half of the brain from the other and there's not many times when we do that anymore it's a kind of one of the older type procedures for epilepsy but still there are some cases where we consider doing it then there are things known as hemispherectomies and in the old days it actually was removal of an entire hemisphere but these days it's just a complete disconnection of uh, of the hemisphere from one to the other side and we use those procedures as i mentioned when when the uh, the part of the brain that's causing the seizure cannot be safely removed for for one reason or another then the the last type of uh therapeutic procedure is the one that's uh these days gaining um a, a lot of interest by by uh researchers and by clinicians uh and by some patients where we try we we, we try to modulate or or change what the brain is doing without removing uh without removing the part that's causing the seizure so um things like vagus nerve stimulation actually fall into that um category but there are other things other types of procedures like deep brain stimulation um like the neuropace device that's a that's another uh type of procedure where we're actually modulating what the brain is doing and and really these procedures are in their infancy so there's a lot of excitement uh but they still pale in comparison in terms of the results compared to the resection procedures they 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 really cannot compare in terms of the results but there's a lot of excitement there because um, as uh, many of the people on this call know not everybody can have a, a resection as safely or as a candidate for it and and uh we need to be able to offer people other types of of procedures so those are the 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 uh, therapeutic procedures we do on the brain okay. for people who have uh, epilepsy now there are other uh, procedures that we do that are diagnostic when we have to find out um uh, exactly where the seizure is coming from and can't do it from uh a, you know just regular EEGs and the regular tests people have sometimes we need to put uh the electrodes to look at, at the electrical patterns deeper and either on top of the brain directly uh or within the substance of the brain so these are e- e- known as as either um um uh, grids or depth electrodes and these allow us to to see with uh, much greater detail exactly where seizures are coming from but these aren't these these aren't therapeutic procedures these are diagnostic procedures that's kind of you know, the 40,000 foot view of of what neurosurgeons do about epilepsy right right and and with corpus callosotomy just because i know there's someone on the line who uh is particularly interested in that um because what is is the use primarily for people who have uh seizures with rapid generalization like uh drop seizures or that type of thing and yeah so so that's how, how it's a very specific group is it most often used for what what types of epilepsy syndromes so so it turns out that that the the uh indication that uh for that for the, for that operation that has uh, had the most um uh, track record is is drop uh, seizures atonic seizures they're called where the 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 seizure is so rapid in progression that basically the entire body goes limp and and people fall to the ground and really hurt themselves um and there's a particular type of um condition known as Lennox Gastaut which is characterized by by these types of seizures and these uh people really I mean you know as people on this call will know that epilepsy makes you much more prone to 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 be injured but these people would get injured um so routinely that that it was at, you know risking their life on a daily basis so the corpus callosotomy prevented um uh, by and large the progression the rapid progression from one side to the other it did not cure the epilepsy and people still were having seizures but they weren't the drop kind of seizures but it turns out that that vagus nerve stimulation also works uh particularly well for those kinds of seizures so we we haven't since they, VNS has come uh, onto the scene, we haven't done nearly as many corpus callosotomies simply because the, the, that's, a, that's a big procedure. It has all the risks of brain surgery um, and, and it really had a viable alternative in, in a procedure that was much less invasive, i.e. Uh, the, the vagus nerve stimulator. Oh, great. 
Okay, so at what point should patients ask their neurologist about surgery? Is this something that they should bring up on their own? Do, do um, neurologists generally bring this up to patients at the appropriate time? When, when should that discussion begin, I guess? Well, so, so this is a sensitive topic, um, and, and it's sensitive because it's been estimated that only roughly one out of 100 uh, people in this country who could benefit from, from surgery actually ever has it. So the question is what happens to the other 99 people out of 100? And, um, and you know, we, we have for the last decade – or more, try to figure that out. It, it's really not clear, but it, 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 there is definitely um, a little bit of reluctance on a part of neurologists to suggest surgery. So um, I, I would say it really depends on the neurologist, and, and there might be a, a generational shift as more of the younger neurologists who were trained more recently and maybe more familiar um, and less uh, um, you know, concerned about some of the old-timey surgeries that were quite quite um, barbaric, uh, more uh, and more familiar with the more modern and, and more refined surgeries, are much less likely to be reluctant to refer their patients. But I say that if, if, a, if somebody who has epilepsy um, and is continuing to have seizures on, you know, two medications uh, or having tried two medications, I think it's time to start talking about it. Um, not every... Not every epilepsy is a candidate for surgery. You know, by, by very nature, the operations that we do are focal operations. We remove a part of the brain that's causing the seizures. There are um, conditions known as primary generalized epilepsies where, where the seizure actually doesn't seem to be coming from any specific point. Um, and, you know, a classic, um, a classic primary generalized seizure is absence. And, and in absence, you really isn't anything you can take out safely uh, because the, the, the seizures start essentially everywhere at the same time. And, and it's probably not a defect in uh, any particular region of the brain, but a defect in how the cells work throughout the brain. So, um, uh, you know, so only the people with focal epilepsy and only those people, I think, who have continued to have seizures even after the second uh, medication, I think at that point it's it's time to start talking about it. So, so as far as you've talked about having a, a, a how how you determine who's a good surgical candidate. So, what what are the minimum criteria for someone to be considered a surgical candidate, and then what makes someone an ideal surgical candidate? And do you have any formal way in which you rate candidates in terms of likelihood of success or likelihood of comp complications, and if, you, if so, do you share that rating with the patient, or is it more just individualized? So uh, I think it's important for everybody to realize that, that when um, surgery is brought up as, a, as an option for the patient, now this is different from somebody asking whether they can be considered for surgery. This is when the, um, uh, their neurologist or neurosurgeon, uh, they meet a neurosurgeon, they say you're a candidate for surgery. That, that when we say that, it's only after an extensive amount of, of testing has been done and data has been gathered to, um, to give us a, a, a very detailed picture of not just what the seizures are like, and not just what the epilepsy is like, but, but also what the, what, you know, what the person's circumstances are and what, um, you know, what their goals are with, with the treatment. I think it's a very important uh, to match um, the the person with with the treatment, so so we we uh, spend a long time reviewing all this information. We get in, we get uh, input from from neurology. We get input from radiology. We get input from uh, neuropsych uh, neuropsychologists. We get input from uh, from social worker. Uh, we get input from from everybody and, and also from me. So um, so basically, at that point, we, when we look at it, we uh, come up with with uh, a guesstimate as to uh -huh. what are the odds that surgery Maybe would a be safe That's true. and 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 b uh, would be um, uh, would offer them a reasonable chance of of being uh, seizure free. Now, reasonable 
is is a uh, um, kind of a floating target because it really, the, you know, even if somebody has a 50% chance of of uh, being relieved of their seizures, they're still a surgical candidate. Um, it's it's just a matter of of then weighing the risks and the benefits. Sometimes uh, that 50% isn't justified by the risk, um, and and so we we have to weigh those things carefully. So when that's when, uh, true. Uh, the minimum criterion, I think, for somebody to be considered is that that balance tips uh, towards the benefit. And that's yeah. a, a lot of that is, is hard to right. quantify. Uh, and when I talk to patients ab- about surgery, we, we talk a lot about, you know, what the risks are and, and then what we feel the odds are of them benefiting from the surgery. And, um, and that that's how we approach it. We don't um, have... Um, when we say somebody's ideal, that means that all the information um, points to one area that's, that's uh, as safe as can possibly be imagined to remove and, and has a very high likelihood of, become, of making them seizure-free. But even then, um, we can't be 100% certain. So we, we share that information with the patient, um, and, and it goes the other way as well. If we feel uh, that somebody's risks are outweigh the benefits, uh, we we essentially do not offer them the surgery. Right. right. We we've talked about sometimes uh, it, it usually involves talking with both a neurologist and a neurosurgeon. So can you explain the respective roles of the neurologist and the neurosurgeon in in epilepsy surgery? Not only in in obviously doing the surgery, but and the pre surgical evaluation, but also in terms of the discussion process and and the uh, decision-making in terms of whether someone is uh, going to have surgery? Well, I, I would say um, that the, uh, the neurologist typically has more influence um, on the patient um, in terms of rating them as a surgical candidate. The decision process there is, is, is fairly complex, um, and the neurologist typically has a much uh, uh, a greater window into the, into the patient's um, um, you know uh, their their health, their lifestyle, their their expectations, their, and also you know what they've experienced in terms of the treatments that they've tried. Um, so neurologist really is the linchpin here in terms of uh, deciding whether a patient is rated as a surgical candidate. If a neurologist doesn't feel that their patient is going to be a surgical candidate, I will never know that they're, of their existence typically. Right. Um, and that's that's why we I feel it's it's very important for us to to work as a team. But if a neurologist is you know out in the community um, and and sees a patient doesn't feel that patient's a surgical candidate, uh, that you know it ends right there. Um, you now occasionally I I will uh, see a patient in my clinic um, refer to me directly for epilepsy surgery um, from maybe their family doctor who's never seen a neurologist and. And, and as, as a matter of course, um, I, I will refuse to, to bypass that whole process. So I, I, I would never consider myself more important in the decision process because of the fact that, that, that you know, you, you have to be, uh, A, um, uh, confident or as confident as possible that you know where the seizures are coming from, and, and B, know that you've tried what's reasonable. It always involves a neurologist, an epileptologist, I would say. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I can put this, the, the, uh, the brakes on if I feel that the surgery isn't safe or that if the, the risk outweighs the benefits um, or, or if I feel that the patient's uh, expectations are unreasonable. So, so I can uh, also, uh, you know, at the, at the end of that process say, you know, this is not, uh, this is not going to work, and I, I don't think it's, we should do it. But, but I think overall, the, the neurologist plays a, a much greater influence on whether a patient is rated a surgical right. candidate. Okay. So, w- when you talk about risks and benefits with with patients, um, specifically the likelihood of success and then complications, um, how how do you quantify these? Uh, obviously, it's it's hard to you can't give someone a, a specific number and say your likelihood of success is 93%. You can't do that. But but do you give people ranges of a percentage of likelihood of success? Do you, do you use success rates that are reported in published studies? Do you uh, refer to your own success rate as a neurosurgeon or, do, or the success rate of the institution where you work? 
um, or do you give a customized range or percentage or likelihood of success based on the individual patient factors? Well, this is a this is a very hard question to answer, Russ. I, I it it because um, um, you know, every patient we see has a little wrinkle um, in, in terms of uh, comparing themselves to to a groups large groups of patients uh, that that it's not often um, reasonable to lump them together uh, with with um, with the averages. So so I like to say to people that. Uh, averages are, um, you know, the, the numbers out there are averages for everybody and apply to no one in particular. Um, and, and but, but given that, um, it, it's kind of a mixture of all of those things that you mentioned. So I, I re- refer to published studies in as much as we can, given the individual uh, variations and, and differences that a particular person has compared to the average. But if somebody is completely you know, all the data falls completely in line with with a study out there. I will definitely utilize the study. Now, we, we also have done our own studies in specific um, in specific instances, and then I will refer to those data as well, the the, the institutional data. But um, actually, at the University of Michigan, we've we've uh, felt that that that's really not enough and not transparent enough, and in fact. Uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, are starting something known as the Transparency Project, oh. not just in FC, uh surgery, uh, but but in all all of our disciplines, where we will, at the end of this process, essentially post on a public website for specific conditions, and I I, I am pushing that epilepsy be one of them, at least temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, be one of them, so that that anybody. And can look up into the website and see for the last, you know, for the last year, for example, this these were our results with temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, so that this is not something that that's sort of hidden in in you know a matter of of dis- discussing specifically with one person. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes, we 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 don't do as good a job on that as as we could at this point. So, um, you know, I use whatever numbers I I see that as best fitting that particular person's uh, circumstances and that person's epilepsy, whether it be published literature, our own literature, and our own experience. And we talk about that at at our um, epilepsy conferences. We talk about, you know, what are the odds that we're going to be helping this person becoming seizure-free or at least helping them reduce their seizures um, and, and try to come to a consensus um, based on, and, and again, ba- they're, they're basing it on their literature as well. So that, that's sort of how we arrive at those numbers. Right. right. Okay. So um, as the topic is epilepsy surgery risks and benefits, let's start by talking about the potential benefits that should be considered when deciding whether or not to have surgery. Um, so uh, talk, talk about, obviously seizure freedom is one of the, the key ones, so talk about that, but then also talk about some other potential benefits and, and what we know about uh, what the research has shown us about um, other possible benefits and whether more research needs to be done to learn more about how likely those benefits are and, and what factors uh, influence whether someone experiences those benefits. Well, you know, um, the, the the main benefit of of epilepsy surgery is is that promise of the potential for freedom from seizures. So that uh, essentially, um, uh, you know, all of those identifications that you have as a, as somebody with epilepsy are suddenly not there, and that you can become more independent and drive and operate machinery and not have to be in constant fear that that that, that you will um, uh, collapse in a in a seizure. Uh, that 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 is that is what we aim for, um, and and are excited when when all the stars align and, and that's what happens. But there, you know, even those people um, who we can't uh, cure of epilepsy, if we can reduce their seizures meaningfully um, and, and make them less um, uh, less problematic, uh, then it, it still helps them if we can reduce the number of medications. So um, the, those those are um, it, you know, medications themselves have uh, side effects and, and cause people to feel like they're in a fog. Um, so they, they themselves are a burden, and if we can relieve them of that burden, um, that's also a success, although it pales in comparison to to relieving people 
entirely of their epilepsy. Uh, one thing that, that isn't talked about much is, and, and we found, find this out uh, only usually when we put in the electrodes inside the head, uh, like with grids and such, that, that people often have a lot more seizures than they know about. And, and um, these are, don't necessarily cause people to convulse or, or to even realize that they're having a seizure. Uh, but but they, 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 their brains are in a constant sort of um, a mini electrical storm. And um, in what they report after the surgery is that not only have they not had the seizures they know about, but they feel uh, less fogged up. And it, it's, I think it's reasonable to, uh, to, as, to ascribe that to the fact that they're not constantly having these mini seizures that are uh, sort of scrambling things around. So, so that, that's, that's a benefit, a uh, potential benefit that some people experience uh, just by having epilepsy surgery. But again, the freedom from seizures themselves um, and, and not needing to worry constantly about having a seizure doing things, uh, I think that's the main, main, main benefit. Right. And you mentioned um, potentially being able to reduce medications. So yeah. probably the majority of people end up still staying on medications after surgery. But um, what do you, uh, again, rough estimate. But do you have a rough estimate of of what percentage are able to at least reduce their medication? Well, it depends on the surgery. Depends on the patient. Yeah. So so I, I I can tell you that that for example with temporal lobe uh, seizures, temporal lobe epilepsy, when we do this. Um, you know, when I first started practicing and doing these things, the goal was always to take people all the way off, so they were taking nothing. And although there are still patients whose neurologists still do that, I see a greater proportion of people as time goes on um, essentially being weaned down to a low dose of one medication. There's not a whole lot of um, data to support this, but the neurologists believe that um, it's, you know, the low dose of one medication essentially it keeps things uh, at bay and, and keeps people seizure-free and symptom-free, um, and they, uh, it reduces the risk of a breakthrough uh, seizure. The feeling there being that once you start having seizures after surgery, it's much, much harder to stop them than it is to prevent them in the first place. So, uh, again, not a whole lot of data to support this, but it's, it's pretty circumstantial uh, and anecdotal that people will now be just in a single dose, of single medication, uh, you know, a year or two after successful surgery, uh, just to prevent having any kind of breakthrough. Because there is, there, there, there are um, uh, people who will be seizure-free for years after surgery, and all of a sudden start having seizures again for reasons that nobody understands. So the, the thought being that, that having that single medication will, will help them. Now, now we've been concentrating on, on surgery, left like temporal lobe surgery and resection surgery, but it, with vagus nerve stimulation, for example, um, the, the, uh, the, it's much more common for people to have their, their medications reduced uh, because the, the uh, idea there is not necessarily cure of epilepsy, but palliation, but you know, relief of the uh, um, of the burden of seizures uh, to the extent that they can, but also relief of the burden of the medications, so that people will typically get uh, down to a lower um, lower dosage or a lower number of medications. Right. right. Okay. So, what are the average? Um post-surgical seizure-free rates for, for the major types of surgery? And I, I guess I would probably just focus on temporal lobe surgery, frontal lobe surgery, and, and any others that you have some general statistics for in terms of seizure-free rates. Right. So so this is when things get murky because okay. not every temporal lobe um, epilepsy is the same. Right. Right. But the, the best rates out there uh, for, um, for temporal lobe um, epilepsy are roughly about 75 to 80 percent seizure-free, um, and I know there was a, a, uh, a randomized study back about 12, 13 years ago that suggested a lower number than that. But again, you you you, you never know that the, the that the population is the same. 
Um, but, but I think most people would agree that about 75 to 80 percent of people um, a, a, after surgery will become seizure-free for temporal lobe, the usual temporal lobe um, epilepsy. Now, the, the numbers fall off dramatically uh, when you when you go outside of temporal lobe. So frontal lobe epilepsy, uh, if you if you have a lesion, if you if you can see something on the MRI. Uh, a, a, an abnormality, and you remove that abnormality, um, you're usually abating about 50% that you will relieve um, um, the, the epilepsy. If you don't see an abnormality and you just catch it on a grid, the number falls even further to the 30s. Um, so, so the numbers fall dramatically if you don't have a, a lesion, especially outside the, the temporal lobe, in the frontal lobe or you know, parietal or in the back of the occipital lobe, the, the numbers aren't, aren't very good, um, especially when you don't see an abnormality. Right. And when you, when you use the term seizure-free, does that, in the literature, is that referring to free of all seizures or free of seizures that affect consciousness? So, so that, that, that refers to seizures that affect consciousness and all what they know, known as troublesome uh, auras. So auras, uh, people might already know, auras are, are actually seizures too. Uh, they're seizures that don't affect consciousness. Um, and they're just kind of feelings people get, uh, usually right before they have the big seizure. Um, some auras are, are, are fairly innocuous. Other auras can be uh, very um, distracting or frightening. Um, so we, we group the ones that are, are either frequent or somehow uh, disruptive uh, uh, with the seizure. So I, I'd say seizure-free would include free of seizures and and or troublesome auras. Okay. So we've talked about uh, benefits. So what are some of the most common complications and functional defi deficits that are associated with epilepsy surgery? And again, we're talking primarily about temporal lobectomy. Um, and how right. likely are they? And then talk a little bit more about what some of the most serious risks are and how likely those are. So, so we we'll start with temporal lobe epilepsy, as you as you suggested. Uh, it really depends on on what temporal lobe you're talking about. If it's the if it's the do, what we call language dominant, or usually in our in most of us the left side, or the right. The safer temporal lobe to operate on is the right side or the non-dominant side because we don't, have, we don't have any language function there. And, and really the most common side effect of operating there um, is, is a, a, essentially an, uh, a loss of a little bit of peripheral vision. And usually uh, when people have it, they, they, never, they don't even know about it. It's something that we can test for. It happens about 25% of our cases um, and it really doesn't affect anybody's function. You can still drive, you can still watch TV, read, and do everything. They really don't ha have any knowledge of it, but when we test for it, we can tell that they've they had it. But it's a side effect. And it has to do with the fact that um, the, uh, some of the pathways for, for the peripheral vision um, uh, to, the, uh, to the side opposite of the surgery, they travel right within the temporal lobe and, and are usually uh, damaged in, in, the, in the course of the surgery. There's really not much you can do uh, to prevent that. But then again, it has no functional consequence uh, unless you're shooting skeet or something where you need to have that extreme peripheral vision. Um, other common side effects, uh, it's not uncommon for people uh, to, to have some emotional changes temporarily after s surgery. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to, to feel blue for a period of usually about two months or so. Um, and we think that that has to do with some imbalance in the, in the uh, emotional circuits that are uh, partly in the temporal lobe and that, that take, just take time to rebalance. Uh, so there is that. And, and of course, there, there is this, the, the surgical, you know, the pain in the side of the head, uh, pain on chewing, headaches that result from that. That's pretty common. Uh, but so usually get, it gets better with time. Yeah. yeah. So, so the things that we see, aside from the the, the visual defect, are, are uh, usually just uh, um, um, just temporary. 
Um, on, the, on the language dominant side, there's, we also worry about language, of course, and, and that has to do with with word finding. And um, it's not uncommon for somebody who has a dominant side of temporal lobe surgery to at least temporarily have some uh, some word finding difficulty after after surgery. But we've looked at our data, and and almost nobody has it long term. And, and so basically, if you have it long term afterwards, that's considered a, a severe a severe complication. Much less common um, a, a side effect. Sometimes you can get some double vision after surgery, and that has to do with one of the nerves that goes to the eye that that travels nearby and is very sensitive to any manipulation. And so, if it even if you're not right on top of it, it just movement of the temporal lobe. And next to it causes it to dysfunction, to malfunction uh, temporarily. So we we've seen that very rarely, but we've seen that. Those are the those are the the uh, most common uh, complications. But the more serious ones, and fortunately the the uh, the uh, much less common one are are, are the, the bad words in neurosurgery, and those are stroke, coma, and death. They're they're true of anything that we do. And probably the single biggest reason why not everybody wants to have brain surgery, um, but uh, basically, um, any time you operate on the brain uh, and, and are in areas that the temporal lobe goes fairly far in, uh, areas that are very sensitive, uh, you, that you expose somebody to the risk of um, of, of a stroke. And um, you know, although we've been fortunate in not having that in our cohort since I've I've been there. It, it has been uh, reported, and I have seen it um, in people that have been previously operated. Uh, it's something that's tragic. And so uh, I, I tell people that that's a possibility, but if you lump all three of those, you know, bad words into neurosurgery, the risk of uh, all that is less than 1% uh, together. So so it's, it's a really, really low risk. Um, and, and I also remind people that, um, the risk of not treating uh, or not trying to rid yourself of epilepsy also has, you know, that also carries um, risks of, of, you know, injury and stroke and coma and death and all that. So even by not having surgery or by not doing something, we, we incur risks. All right. That's certainly true um, with SUDEP, which, you know, is um, oh, absolutely. sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, which is much higher risk in, in people with uncontrolled seizures. So I imagine that's something that um, it, it should, it should be considered by anyone who's considering surgery. Yeah, especially if, if the odds that are given them uh, in terms of being rid of their epilepsy with surgery are, are good, good odds. Right. Um, and in ter uh, another thing I've, I've heard several people mention, um, and I'm not sure how common it is, is uh, memory problems after surgery. Um, it, does that is that fairly common? Does that happen often, is, or or is it are you able, even able to tell whether that's due to the surgery or whether that's due to the underlying epilepsy itself? Yeah, that's that's. So, so we have this discussion um, fairly um, routinely, and I tell people, you know, they, the, the most common question I get, to an, get, get asked in terms of memory is, will, will I forget things that I already know, like who, who, who I am or who other people in my life are? And, and we don't understand a whole lot of where memory is stored, but it's pretty clear that, that the temporal lobe is is involved in formation of new memories, what people know as short-term memory. Um, you know, all short-term all short-term memory eventually becomes long-term, right? But right. but um, no matter what, uh, memory uh, uh, dysfunction happens in the short term. So you so even if you were going to have a problem with your memory after surgery, it's never things that you already know. Uh, those are not stored there anymore. Uh, but but the hippocampus, that part of the of the of the um, temporal lobe that that uh, is usually the culprit in seizures, that, that the main role of the hippocampus is to help you form new memories. And fortunately, um, 
you know, we have two of them. We have one on each side. And in part of the pre-surgical workup for temporal lobe epilepsy is a test known as the WADA test. It's named after a guy named June WADA um, who um, invented this test where you get a catheter put into your um, artery and they shoot um, a, a, a short-acting short acting barbiturate that, that um, and puts half your brain asleep and for about a period of about 10 minutes. The other half of the brain is is still unaffected, so you don't lose consciousness. Uh, but you're unable to use that side of the brain uh, for those ten minutes or, or so. And while while that half of the brain is sleeping, they show you a variety of items. And um, and then when your brain wakes up, they ask you what they showed you. And basically, that tests. Uh, whether or not you will have memory problems. That's as good as we can get in terms of memory testing. Um, but it, it does it does pretty much guarantee that after epilepsy surgery, temporal lobe epilepsy surgery, that you won't be what is known as amnestic. You won't be an amnesiac. You will be able to form new memories. Now, um, it, it, as it turns out, it does. It's not a foolproof test in that um, you know we, we don't get shown. You know, pans and pencils and and forks and, and things of that nature. That's that's not what we think of as remembering. We think of remembering as remembering facts and remembering numbers and remembering people's names and 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 those kind of things. And we can't test that in a WADA test. And so, basically, what I tell people as far as that's concerned, and I usually have the WADA results um, in front of me when I talk to them is that the more the hippocampus that um, that we're about or planning to take out, the more it's doing for you, the, the more normal its function, the more you're likely to miss it when we take it out, at least on a short-term basis. So I, I operated on a patient who was a pre-med student, and, and um, he had almost perfectly symmetrical um, a function. In other words, when they did the WADA test on him, he was able to remember everything, no matter which side of the brain he was using. And and so when so he initially didn't want to have surgery because I told him that you know his his chances of of noticing the loss of the hippocampus um, were going to be much higher. And and especially with him being you know pre med and having to remember all kinds of facts and figures and so on for, for his MCATs, for his tests, uh, I, I told him I didn't think that, uh, um, you know, he could reliably uh, go to the MCATs afterward, even after he recovered, and, and, do, um, and do as well as, as he wanted to. Um, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, I, I heard a beep here. It might be a battery thing here. Okay. Um, in any case, um, so he initially did not have surgery went to take the MCATs. He said, I'll just have to take the MCATs first, and then I'll have surgery, okay. which I thought was reasonable. But, but then he, he went to take the MCATs, and he was so stressed out about the test that the day of surgery he had eight seizures during the test and essentially um, it had, to, it had to not complete the exam. And, and so he, we ended up doing the, uh, doing, the t- doing the procedure, doing the operation. And, and about a year later when we talked about it, he said it took him – at least six months till he felt that he could start remembering things the way he used to. So there is there is something that happens there, even if the WADA test suggests that the hippocampus we leave in is is functioning well. It does have to take on some new function. Now, if somebody comes in and their WADA suggests that the hippocampus that we plan to remove can't remember anything on its own, those people truly will not notice anything when we take it out because it's already doing nothing. And then there are the people who are kind of in between. And those people, um, it really depends on how much they use it on a regular basis. In other words, if, they, if they're you know, lawyers and are, they're constantly arguing briefs and re- referring to things that they have to remember, uh, that, that could be a problem. Uh, but if if they're not, if they're just you know doing regular kind of work that that, uh, that that doesn't require that kind of thing, then they're not likely to to notice um, in the loss of a hippocampus. Okay. Does that kind yeah. of answer it? I know yeah. it's kind of a long answer, but yeah. 
do you see in typically, I don't know if you do pediatric surgeries as well, but um, do you see uh, better results in terms of memory function and with, with children and, that, and because their brains, brains have more plasticity? Yeah, I think in general that's true. So, that, you know, children uh, and even young adults do much better than, than the rest of us. Okay. Uh, in, in no matter what the the, the uh, procedure or the insult is. So I think, yes, there, there's a lot of uh, going at patients. Because there's still so much we don't know about how the about the brain and how it works, how likely it is, is it that there'll be subtle post-surgical changes that aren't really explicitly tested for in pre-surgical evaluation or reported in the, in the literature? Probably in most studies they're looking at seizure freedom and there may be one or two secondary outcomes, but subtle things like personality changes or other minor changes in certain functions. Uh, is that something that when you talk with people afterwards, do you ever hear someone saying, you know, I, I had the surgery, but this something's a little different now, and I, you know, and and it's something that maybe you wouldn't have anticipated. Um, I, I I don't know if I'm explaining myself well, but um, just some of those subtle differences. Uh, how likely is it that those might happen? Yeah, I have to say I have not seen uh, anybody come back and say, you know, it's made me a different person in a way that um, that that's been bothersome. I have seen people come back and say, you know, I. I'm, you know, uh, chipper. I, I, you know, or, or, uh, you know, people, especially with, with, uh, you know, my, uh, parents and uh, and their young adults uh, living at home, um, where they know they notice how the behavior they say is is much better. They're in a better mood. So I don't ever hear um, that that it's affected their quality of life in an adverse kind of way. We've talked a little bit about this already, but cognitive function and, and mood are two major uh, quality of life issues that, that can be affected by epilepsy and by epilepsy surgery. Um, and and <clears throat> I've certainly heard reports of them getting better or getting worse. Yeah. And, and so can you talk about the potential impact of epilepsy surgery on those uh, two things, mood and cognitive function, and, and the extent to which that can be predicted. Uh, we, we've kind of covered this a little bit already, but um, anything else? Yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned, with a temporal lobe, again, bar any complications, right? So if somebody has, you know, a major problem from surgery or their healing process uh, or complications, I, I don't see uh, their cognitive function and or mood being worse. Uh, there is one caveat, however, and that is, it, we don't often talk about this, but but um, a lot of the patients that we treat have had epilepsy for a very long time, and and a, a long enough time that it really the epilepsy it, 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 it really assailed their ability to integrate into society in, in a way that that you know we consider as as normal. So they they essentially get identified by society as being you know epileptic. And that affects their ability to get around, affects their ability to be educated, to get a job, to really, you know, assume what, what, you know, a lot of us take for granted. And, and, um, with, you know, successful epilepsy surgery, when we consider successful, all of a sudden, we've taken away their identity as an epileptic. And, and that can have, um, a very insidious, uh, 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 kind of, kind of effect in that we have removed the, the, the one thing that they're identified with, and it can cause a lot of psychic stress um, because then you essentially are no longer epileptic, but you still haven't had the education and you you, you don't have the job, and and all of a sudden you really have a crisis of, of it's an exist, really an exist, existential crisis, and uh, there it's it's not unheard of for people to become clinically depressed after successful brain surgery. Has nothing to do with cognitive state, and everything to do with the, the fact that that you know um, in our society uh, we have um, you know essentially identified these people as epileptics and and really have not don't really have the social networks and the and the, the infrastructure to integrate people back into society in a way that that um, allows for them to catch up 
And sometimes it's really impossible to catch up, right? So in the job market where, where the, you know, it's hard enough to get a job, you know, with just a college degree, now you're asking uh, for the job market to take on somebody who spent their life as an epileptic. And it's no longer so. So it's it's really hard on these people, and in a way that I think physicians can sometimes uh, not understand. Right. So it, you know that's that's um, that's something difficult to talk about uh, because we consider these people success stories um, because they no longer have seizures. But yet it's a it's a huge psychic burden um, on them and on their families sometimes. So uh, so that's that's some, an unintended consequence of successful. Surgery. If that's what you're talking about, uh, in a little bit, I thought I'd mention that. Right. And and how often um, do you see improvements in in mood and cognitive function as a result of the surgery? And, oh, I see that, that all the time. That that, that's that's to, far out, out. Sorry. Is that, is that due to the, because to the reduction of those subclinical seizures that we talked about earlier, the or the interictal discharges? Is that part of the reason why you might? Have better cognitive function or mood. Yeah, I think that I think that certainly a potential explanation for it. Uh, and the other could be you know, a reduction in doses of medicines and the ability to you know to to get to to get around on your own, not to be infantilized, uh, but by having to ask somebody for a ride everywhere you went and you know the greater freedom you have. And so I think the the, the improvement in mood is certainly. Um, uh, something we see much more frequently than, than the scenario I just painted right. um, uh, before. Okay. So um, what are some questions that patients should ask when selecting a neurologist or, or a health system or a neuro- neurosurgeon for their epilepsy surgery? Um, obviously, there's a lot of choices. That are, Michigan's very fortunate to have six comprehensive epilepsy programs. Um, but what are what are some of the questions that uh, would would be good for a patient to ask when they're choosing who's going to do their surgery? Well, um, so I, I would start by asking whether they have a comprehensive epilepsy program and an epilepsy monitoring unit. Um, it, it, it's um, it's important that that whatever um, health system is treating um, a person has an, a comprehensive approach, uh, so that Essentially, they can um, consider the the, uh, the explanations for the for where the seizures are coming from, the alternative explanations, to to be able to really look at the full gamut of of options, surgical and non-surgical, before offering uh, the, the patient um, the ability to have um, one of those uh, treatments, whether it is surgery or not. I think you know the the problem with going uh, to a place where they may have an epilepsy neurologist who then if you know if there is something that needs to be done has to send the patients out somewhere else. The problem there is that it, 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 things can get fragmented, um, and you know people don't tend to talk to each other as much, uh, and don't tend to um, uh, arrive at probably you know, the best decision possible for the patient. And also, if 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 the if the it's not a comprehensive epilepsy program, then it's not as likely that you're um, going to have a, a surgical team that has experience with all the different types of surgeries that I talked about. And, and you know, if you only have, um, you know, if you only have one hammer, everything is going to look like a nail. And and I I worry about that when when you know a, a, a surgical um, a center can, you know, doesn't do any invasive monitoring. You know, we're talking about the grids and the depth electrodes and such. Not because it's necessarily bad in doing the other things. It's, it's, it, it may assign patients to those other interventions just because it can't do anything else. And I, I worry about that a lot in terms of, you know, trying to provide people with, with the best possible treatment. So, um, so I think Questions like, you know, what kinds of surgeries do you do here? Um, how, you know, you know, you can ask them how many um, temporal lobe resections they do in a year. Um, but I think the more telling thing is, you know, how many um, how many uh, grid placements do you do in a year? If they don't do any grid placements, not that you would want to have one necessarily, but 
I think it just kind of tells you, um, you know, just how well versed they are in some of the less, um, uh, some of the less common procedures and, and how likely they are to consider those options if, if that's the right choice. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. So, but I think, you know, numbers, um, are, are kind of important in that way, although, you know, if you compare a place that does you know, ten grids in the in the year with a place that does twenty. It doesn't mean that the twenty grids per year place is is any better. Right. right. And, but but I think it's you know if, that, if one place does no grids and the other one does ten, I, I think that's a much bigger um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a much bigger uh, difference there. Right. Okay. So if, if you have a patient who's an excellent candidate for surgery. Uh, from your perspective, but that patient is still reluctant to go through with it. How do you view your role in that situation, um, and and what other options might, if they're dead set against having surgery, what other options might you suggest? Well, I, I would never, I would never twist anybody's arm into having surgery. So that, that uh, I would say that right off the bat. Uh, if if um, if somebody comes to see me. They've usually already made the decision that, that they want to at least hear about surgery. Yeah. Um, but I have had more than one patient say, after I talked to them, I was like, you know, listen, I, I'm not ready for this. And that's fine. I, I, I say basically um, at, at that point, you know, if you want to consider those options, if you ever change your mind, you know, you call me at any time and we can talk some more. But my main role, I think, mostly is to is to educate the patient, make sure that they know what they're saying, that they understand what they are opting for and against, um, and they know the consequences of the decision on either side. Uh, I, I try to I try to be um, as even-handed as I can about it. I don't sugarcoat anything, um, and, but but I I also think that it's important um, that that they do understand what um, you know what. The decision they're making is, and if at that point they say, you know, listen, it, I'm too scared to have brain surgery, that's that's fine. And then, you know, then we can talk about, you know, well, if if you're if it's if it's too uh, scary to have brain surgery, there are other options. Some of them surgical, like a vagus nerve stimulator. Um, some of them are medical options, and you can come back and always reconsider surgery. So, so we we talk about those things as well. So we mentioned a little bit about some uh, newer device-based therapies, but as, as more of these device-based therapies uh, uh, for epilepsy become available, do you foresee a reduced need for resective surgery in the future, or, or do you expect that these therapies will continue to lag behind resective surgery in terms of outcomes? Well, so there's, there's several questions there. Uh, I, I think that those, those uh, to last, the first question, your, your last question first, Okay. I, I, I'd say that those um, um, modulation of the, the, these, these um, neural pace and vagus nerve stimulation and deep brain stimulation and those things, they, they're always going to lag behind resective surgery. I don't think they'll ever be as good. Um, but uh, they, they do open the door for treatment of people who just aren't candidates or are less than optimal candidates for the resective surgery. And so they essentially open the door for, for other people who previously wouldn't have thought to, uh, to be considered uh, for resection. That, I think that's where their role is. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they would ever um, uh, reduce the need for resective surgery simply because I think resective surgery is so wildly underutilized. As I mentioned in the beginning of the call, only one out of 100 or so People who uh, who's a candidate for resective surgery ever actually gets one, right. um, and that, that doesn't count all those people who want resective surgery but just are not candidates. Right. So, so um, one one group that might benefit in particular from something like the neuropace, or it would be people with multifocal epilepsy. Is that correct? Multifocal epilepsy is one, or or epilepsy coming from areas that are um, that that can't be removed because of functional considerations. Right, right. That, that's another. Yeah, and those probably are the two most common. Okay. Great. Most common things. Um, another thing that you know I I get a lot of questions about is people hear about a 
what's perceived to be a, a new technology that's, that's less invasive, uh, things like the RNS or neuropace, but also things like gamma knife surgery or, or using surgery that, you know, most of the times people say, I've heard about this new laser surgery, and, and it, really what's yeah. happening is just using a laser instead of a scalpel. But um, they, they tend to gravitate towards that new technology. Uh, yeah, I think it's because as an... As, and, right. Yeah. Yeah, it, and it's because we, we, we as a society tend to be enamored of technology. Sure. Um, and, you know, we have, you know, the Apple this and the iPod that and, um, it, it, those things tend to, tend to attract people because there's a natural assumption that, that somehow they represent advances. Um, and they are advances, but I think they're not advances in terms of replacing, uh, the, the kinds of procedures that we do that do work. Uh, so things like the gamma knife. The gamma knife, for those in, in, who are listening and don't know, it is, that's a form of uh, focused radiation, and, and it's focusing 200 beams of radiation onto a specific area deep in the brain. And the, the whole idea behind the gamma knife is that you can essentially fry that one little tiny spot with the, the beams of radiation without as much effect on everything around it. It's a great idea. In fact, it was invented by a neurosurgeon back in the 60s. Um, but, you know, the, the problem is that it is radiation. And and um, so radiation doesn't always work right away, and sometimes it works too well. Um, and it's really hard to know how big an area you're going to be radiating. And the bigger the area you radiate, the bigger uh, the, the effect on the brain in general. So it, it's got, it got some downsides. Um, and and uh, the gamma knife, I know it was it was studied in, uh, for epilepsy, but you know the results were were pretty mediocre. Um, and so at this point, it's not a viable alternative for things that we talked about. Uh, the laser ablation is is actually even even more um, straightforward. In that they basically put a probe deep to the area, just right to the area where we think the seizures are coming from. And, and they, they essentially heat it up with a, with a laser, uh, and fry it with a laser. So it, 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 it's again something fairly, um, rudimentary what being done, even though, although laser sounds so, so, uh, uh, high tech, it really is just a, a way to destroy tissue in an area, um, that you have a hard time getting to. And that's where those, uh, procedures are going to gain any foothold is, when, this, when the epilepsy is coming from, this, from an area that is dangerous to get to otherwise. Mm-hmm. So there is a, there's a, for example, there is a, a kind of epilepsy called, um, uh, a kind of seizures called gelastic seizures. These are seizures that are, originate uh, from an area of the brain known as the hypothalamus, which is um, responsible for a lot of our hormonal functions. Um, and and that area can be difficult and or dangerous to get to, and uh, there are some good results with with doing gamma knife there or doing um, uh, you know laser or not right now this thing known as focused ultrasound which does the same thing, again heating up and destroying tissue deep without affecting the surrounding tissue. That's where those kind of procedures are are, are likely to offer benefit, but they note the place. Um, resective surgery for the, for those people who need that. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, because we, I think we do have some people on the call who have already had surgery. I wanted to see if anyone wanted was willing to describe their decision making process and what some of the key factors were that ultimately led them to choose surgery. Does anyone want to share your experiences um, as someone who had surgery? And remember to, to unmute your line, you just dial star six. So anyone is welcome to unmute their lines now. So. I wouldn't mind doing that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Dave Trojan, uh, Dr. Sager, I high regard for you and the University of Michigan. I think it was I very you well. I think there was some very extensive testing done, and the University of Michigan was the only hospital or institution that was able to detect uh, my surgery, so uh, that's, what else did you want me to discuss, Russ? What, what, what were some of the factors that 
led to your decision to have surgery? I mean, what was was there a tipping point or something that made you go, you know what, I think I'm going to go through with this? Well, through all the testing that was done, it was so thorough in my mind. And then talking to Dr. Sager, and uh, it came down to, is there any other way to get rid of these seizures? And his opinion was no. So I was in that stage of, uh, you know, do I... Do I want to get rid of them, or do I want to live with this? So I made that decision. Right. And how? Who were, who were some of the people that helped with your decision, and, and how did they help? Obviously, Dr. Sager did. Were there, were there family members that helped you with that as well? Well, sure. There was a big battery of friends and uh, family. But the, like I say, the battery of tests, the people that were involved, have a high regard for the University of Michigan. And... Uh, you know, I didn't know much about it, and I knew a lot about it when that was all done. Right. So. And if you had it to do all over again, would you still have epilepsy surgery? Would you do anything differently? Well, I believe I would, I would have it done again. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks for sharing. Does anyone else, uh, anyone else on the line already had surgery and want to share their experiences in terms of the decision-making process? And Russ? Yeah. Great show. Yep. Um, I had it tried back in 2003, you know, at the University of Chicago, but it didn't work. Okay. Okay. And and do you have any regrets about trying or uh, just just regrets that it didn't work? Uh, it's, it's just regrets that it didn't work, you know. My, and my doctor was in and was so sure that it would work. Yeah. And, and and when you say it didn't work, what, was there no improvement or just didn't yeah, get, there didn't was get basically no no improvement. I feel okay. okay. But, but I've learned that, you know you know to avoid all, um, all kind of stress I've had in life, and you know, it seems to help. Sure. So right. So sometimes if, if the surgery doesn't work, you have other options of ways yeah. that you can minimize seizures. So right. Um, have you ever considered uh, being reevaluated for surgery? Um, and that's a question for Dr. Sager, too. If, if someone has had unsuccessful surgery, and let's say it was 10, 20 years ago, um, is it a good idea to, con- to reconsider or be reevaluated if you're still having seizures? So, so yeah, we see... Um that not infrequently when pe- people have had either surgical evaluations uh, or actual surgeries where where the, re- the results uh, weren't um, you know weren't uh, weren't uh, good in terms of you know relieving people from their epilepsy, but you know I I only hear about those people after a thorough um, uh, kind of workup where it appears that that there is something to go after. Um, you know, those people who've had surgery and then their uh, pre, uh, their, their workup afterwards suggest that there's nothing really to go after. I never actually, um, hear about those people. But I'm sure there's a fair number of those, but, but yeah, so, so I, I, I see people pretty routinely who've either had, uh, surgical screening with grids and, or, or even without grids, but some surgical screening or actual surgery to remove a part of the brain. And, and uh, had persistent uh, re- recurring seizures, and and uh, when they got reevaluated, actually it turns out that they, there was an area that needed to um, still be addressed. So, um, so yes, yeah, that that happened, and and uh, we we look at those patients as well, and we operate on them on the okay. stage as well. Is, is there a, a typical waiting period, or I mean, do you have to wait a certain while for the brain to fully heal before you would consider having surgery again? I think you know. So I, I, don't, I think people are pretty reluctant to have right. brain surgery too quickly, anyway. Sure. Uh, so we've never bumped up against uh, somebody wanting it too soon. Yeah. Uh, but typically, typically we uh, would see them at least five years after right. their initial surgery. Okay. Uh, but I think I don't know if that's. I don't think there's a minimum waiting period. I think it just has to do with. Um, with, with the, the person, the person themselves, you know, right. because the situation is fluctuating. Right. And I imagine, obviously, that the the diagnostic um, procedures are, are, have improved vastly over the past 10, 20 years, and, and that your uh, 
able to pinpoint the seizure focus a lot better than uh, 10, 20 years ago, right? Yeah, absolutely. I can remember now that you mentioned it. It was one of my patients is um, is still seizure free. He's fifty something when I operated on him uh, for his epilepsy, and had been operated when he was six. Oh. Uh, so fifty years prior, um, and at the time there was no CAT scan, there was no MRI. Obviously, there was nothing. It was just you know they, they just did. Uh, but they they thought they knew where it was coming from in terms of the side of the brain, the general location. They just opened them up. <laughs> so, wow. And then they looked at they looked at things. They didn't see anything abnormal, so they closed them up. So that's so. I, I think it's fair to say that things have changed a lot. And even people who have been operated maybe not 50 years ago, but maybe even 10 or or, or 20, that that our imaging, especially with MRI scans, have, have become so good now that that previously people who have been thought to have what are known, you know, thought to be normal MRI scans, uh, we find now um, that their MRIs have these subtle abnormalities that we can then focus on in terms of our workup and see whether those are abnormalities are the cause. So the biggest change we've had really in the last 10 to 15 years has been our imaging. It's just gotten so good um, that that we can oftentimes find uh, abnormalities that, that, you know, years ago we would have never seen. Um, and we can also avoid having uh, to put grids in a lot of people that we previously would have had to put grids in because we couldn't really tell. Now, if we, if, if we see an abnormality in the MRI, um, it really gives us a much finer target and a much higher chance of being successful. Okay, well, I, I do want to open it up for, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to open it up for questions if anyone uh, participates. Dr. Or, uh, uh, Russ, this is Bob Fisher. Hey, uh, Doctor, um, I've talked to Russ about the situation we have with our six-year-old grandson. He seems to be a three-year-old in a six-year-old body. He's unable to, seems to be unable to do much learning. And he seems to be in, in uh, constantly have little seizures, and then out of nowhere, bang, he falls onto the floor. He has to wear a helmet at all times because of this uh, problem of da damaging his brain because of the way he falls. Um, is there any age limit uh, as to what you would suggest in case uh, uh, surgery would be advisable? I'm sorry to hear about that. That sounds that sounds awful. It is uh, it, bad. It's just bad. Yeah, it's really bad because that's you know the period of time in in you know um, a person's life where you do the most learning and and uh, the most development, and it, it really can um, set the tone for the rest of your life. Is there such I, a thing as monitors that can like uh, with heart trouble that can be installed in the body? Well, there's nothing permanent that gets that that we, that we can do. But uh, my my my, uh, my thought was in, in you describing. So so turns out that the children have um, a, a number of different types of seizures, and in general, their epilepsies are very different from adult epilepsies, and they they have a, a far greater uh, chance of having um, either primary generalized epilepsies, and that those can't be operated or having what are known as cortical dysplasias. And those are those are abnormalities of uh, in, in the formation of the brain, you know, in, in the mother's womb. And in those situations, the, the abnormality is typically not, for example, in the temporal lobe. It, it can be in other areas. You still can do surgery, but, but it, it does require a fairly um, extensive kind of workup to see you know where, where the seizures are coming from. Whether it, it is a focus, ep, a focal epilepsy, and if it is a focal epilepsy, if it is coming from one specific area in the brain, but they do they do need to be worked up extensively for it. But you know, and most comprehensive epilepsy programs, including ours, have a pediatric uh, component to them and have pediatric epilepsy specialists, including pediatric epilepsy neurosurgeons. I, I didn't mention one of my uh, colleagues, Hugh Garten. He's he's, uh, he's my counterpart in in, in the children's realm, right. um, and uh, you know he typically does the surgeries on the 
uh, under your very young. And, and there's no age limit to, to doing these surgeries. In fact, um, you, you know, the earlier you can get to them, the better. It's, it's unlikely that we would ever do, you know, babies. Uh, but but uh, certainly um, a, a six-year-old would not would be right in smack dab in the middle of the age range that that Hugh operates on. So it's not not really an age limit. Well, you know, he has such a short uh, attention span, and uh, we try to read to him, uh, and he'll sit there a few minutes, and and uh, before you know it, he wants to do something else, and so on. And yeah, that, uh, might, that might not be the epilepsy, right? I mean, there are. There are a number of behavioral uh, kind of abnormalities that that can accompany epilepsy, but are not in and of themselves seizures. Mm-hmm. So people can have, the, like for example, ADD and other kind of behavioral sort of abnormalities that can come with epilepsy, but are not actually epilepsy. Mm-hmm. So I'm not and sure. He walks. Happens. It's very he's had too much to drink. Uh, he's staggering all over the place. And you don't know whether that means he's going to fall or what he's going to do. So during the day, he's got to be watched almost 100% of the time. And he wears his helmet. We don't. Uh, we take it off when he goes to bed. And then we have to watch when he wakes up to make sure that someone's there. So he, because he has these seizures, right, as soon as he wakes up. Yeah, that that sounds terrible. Has he been evaluated by? Uh... Well, he goes to, we take him to Ann Arbor. I wish I, I, I don't have the doctor's name, but he's on, uh, 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 O-N-F-I is one of the medicines. Oh, Auntie. Yeah, Auntie. And Banazel or something, B-A-N-Z-E-L. Those are the two medicines he's taking right now. Well, I can tell you that the pediatric epilepsy team here um, is is fully engaged in the comprehensive epilepsy program. So, if if they, you know, I'm not sure what stage he's at in terms of that, and whether he's been it's been determined that he's not an epilepsy surgery candidate. But it's not an age thing. It really isn't. It, mm-hmm. it, it's not not every epilepsy um, is, is you know something that can be surgically mediated. So, um, uh, it's it's one of those things that has to be individualized to the person. Okay. Do other people have any questions? This is Matt. Yeah. I was wondering, what's the longest recovery patient you've had? What, what, do, what you do you mean by that, sir? Well, he's like, I've had surgery back in 10, and i still having little seizures. And I was just wondering, my doctor said, well, on average, it could take you up to two years to fully recover from surgery. And I was looking at like two years of, yeah, by two years maybe I'll be relieved of seizures. But well, I mean, I, I don't think that um, the surgical recovery uh, is, is something that typically um, happens mostly within the first six months to one year. Um, and then I'm talking about uh, there. I'm talking about this recovery of function and just being feeling normal. So uh, on the outside, I would say one year, two years. Uh, in my experience, is is a bit long to, to consider that surgical recovery. But I, I think that having continued seizures is not necessarily an issue of recovery. It's an issue of um, you know that's the kind of the surgical result you get, and it may it, it may be that the surgery did not. Relieve all the seizures and it won't. And, and I think at two, at three years, you really have to consider that um, that possibility. Right. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question, sir? Well, yeah, yeah. Because um, at one time, like after six months, they tried wean me off of medication, and when yes. they did wean me off of one medication. Then I started having a seizure again, and then they put me back on the medication. And then, well, like I said, I would I was trying to hopefully start driving again. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. And, and I mentioned earlier in the call that that's that's the biggest reason I think that I've seen more and more people stay on some medication after surgery that's seemingly successful 
is this sort of experience that some people have where uh, they have a breakthrough, and once they have that breakthrough, it seems to kind of grease the skin, um, and it's really hard for them to get control again. I, I don't know how much of that is um, you know, driven by data or how much of that is just anecdotal, but it's precisely this kind of story that, that you know, the neurologists are um, using to, to, to keep people on medications. And there, might be, there might have some truth to it. I don't know. But it, it, it's hard to know what would have happened if you had stayed on that medication. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question or comment. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, Dave Trojan again. I have to make one more comment if I could for Dr. Sager. I, I, I did have uh, seizures after uh, my surgery, but I, I have to say that I believe lifestyle has a huge impact on uh, your recovery and your seizures. I don't know if it's ironic or not, Dr. Sager, but uh, my wife had talked to me about quitting smoking, and I just kept smoking away for a long time, and and, and I quit after a seizure one time, and I never had a conscious seizure again. And that's been well over two years, so. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> I'm going to use that story, David, if you don't mind. <laughs> I, no, I wish you all my kids would stop smoking. Uh, that's why I think it's lifestyle, and uh, I think there's no coincidence there. It's, it's, I've never had a conscious seizure since. Well, it's interesting you should mention that because you know we, nicotine is is uh, um, it, it, it actually does does interact with your neurotransmitters. That's why people get addicted to nicotine. Um, it really actually does work on the brain, and so it doesn't. It makes sense that it would have some effect on on your on your um, nervous system. Um, and so it, it, it's interesting that that stopping your smoking it changes your seizures and make them makes them uh, less bothersome or less you know less of conscious. And you were C C recently on a bunch of various tests that I've had and I have improved on most tests to where before I was before the surgery. That's excellent. So that's when when uh, I think Craig was the one who spoke earlier about recovery. Um, that that's where that's what I consider recovery is recovery of function. Um, and so any kind of loss that you may experience from having surgery to remove part of your brain or anything of that nature, that's, your brain is constantly recovering from a, everyday insults, um, and that surgery is one of those things. So that I, I would say those things tend to take a little bit more time. Okay. That's great news, though. It is great news, yeah. Um, so I, I, it is uh, 7.30, so I want to um, close things up. So uh, I, I thank you so much, Dr. Sager, for, for joining us tonight. And, My pleasure. And, uh, so uh, thanks again, Dr. Sager, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. And, yes, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sager. My pleasure. I'm glad to have spent the time with you guys. Great. I hope you all learned something. And thank happy you. holiday thank to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good night. Okay, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night, Ross.